This study in the New Testament book of John is offered for the edification of all students of God's Word by spiritandtruth.org. Pastor Andy Woods of Sugarland Bible Church will be our instructor during this study. It is our prayer that this study will deepen your understanding of the Bible and allow you to draw closer in your relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17.3 Now let's begin our time of study in this important and fascinating book of the Bible. Well, good morning. If we could take our Bibles and open them to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, beginning at verse 32. Uh, The title of our message this morning is A Suffering Messiah? Question mark. And as you're turning there, let me make you aware of a couple of DVDs that we just put out on the table near the ladies' restroom. These are DVDs, so don't play them in your car. And you don't want to be watching a DVD while you're driving anyway, right? So that makes sense. But uh, I had a chance to be involved with the Stealing the Mind conference, And I was hoping they would send me the whole conference, but they didn't. They sent me my own presentation. They said, do with it what you wish. And so I'm doing what I wish with it. I made, we made uh, a lot of copies. If you're interested in it, it's an analysis of anti-Semitism in the world. Going through the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse by verse. And I uh, had the opportunity to be one of 16 in- individuals interviewed on the David Reagan TV show covering different issues related to the book of Daniel. So if you're interested in problems in the book of Daniel and what people think about how those so-called problems can be resolved, uh, everybody I've talked to that's watched those presentations has been very appreciative. But uh, David Reagan sent me the whole thing. It's on two discs. There's about six shows on it. And he said, do with it what you wish. And so I'm doing with it what I wish. We made a bunch of coffees. and They're available at the back table. And uh, if we run out, don't panic. We will make some more. Just want to let you know those are out there and available. We uh, are working our way through John's Gospel. I really like John's Gospel because it's about my favorite person. Jesus Christ, our favorite person. It, uh, in essence, is a revelation of Jesus as the Son of God, the Christ, as evidenced through his miracles, with the hope that John's unbelieving audience will believe in Christ and have life. So at every juncture, John shows who this man Jesus Christ is how he is an abnormal person historically through his claims and through the evidence of his miracles. And uh, we have finished that very large section of his ministry, which is that part two that I have underlined, spans about 11 chapters. And in essence, it's a record of his signs that he performed. There's seven of them. We've gone through those. And we are now moving into chapter 12. In fact, we're working our way out of chapter 12, believe it or not, which is really the final week of the life of Christ. Passover, the great Jewish holiday, is right around the corner. And Jesus will be crucified for the sins of the world on Passover. And so that is where Jesus is. It is his final trip into Jerusalem out of about five trips total that he makes in John's gospel 
Because at this point, Jesus will die for the sins of the world in just a few days. The scenario is in Jerusalem, celebrating that great Jewish feast called Passover. It's just it's going to be a little bit different this time because Jesus is the Passover lamb who will be slain. He is the fulfillment of all of that Old Testament typology regarding Passover, which we have talked about in prior sermons, so we won't go back into that. But it is a great crowd that has assembled for this day, as typically happened regarding these feast days within the nation of Israel. Jesus, in chapter 12, rides into Jerusalem, giving national Israel one more opportunity to embrace him as their king. Consequently, verses 1 through 11 begin with the anointing of Jesus Christ by Mary, a beautiful scene of worship. Verses 12 through 19 is Palm Sunday, where Jesus rides into Jerusalem in fulfillment of multiple Old Testament prophecies, proclaiming his messianic credentials. The nation, as we will see, particularly in verse 37, which we may get to today, will turn down the offer. But the whole scene here triggers, in verse 20 through verse 50, about 30 verses, a series of conversations. There are about three conversations happening. Jesus and the disciples is conversation one. And that's where he calls his disciples into a deeper level of discipleship. And then there's a very brief conversation between Jesus and the Father. In fact, there's a voice from heaven as the Father speaks and Jesus speaks, verses 27 through 28. That's where the song we just sang about glorify your name. That's where we learn that through what is about to happen on Passover through the death of Jesus Christ, will fulfill, glorify the triune God. And then there is a series of questions and answers and a rather lengthy conversation between Jesus and the Passover crowd. In fact, that conversation is so long, we have to divide it into two parts. Verses 29 through 36 is round one. Verses 37 through 50 is round two. We began last time looking at the first round of that conversation as Jesus is now engaged in questions with this throng of Jews that had gathered to celebrate Passover. First, the crowd spoke to Jesus in verse 29. The crowd is astonished that they've heard this voice from heaven, not fully understanding who that voice was that was talking. Some misunderstand the voice as an angel. Others thought it was thunder. But it truly was a voice from heaven identifying the purpose of Jesus Christ. Why his life came to this particular point. It existed for the purpose of glorifying the Father. We have made the point that that is the purpose of our lives as we follow Christ into discipleship. The crowd, though, doesn't fully grasp what is happening. Part of the problem is they are unbelievers, and that's why Jesus keeps telling them all the way to the end of this conversation to believe. In fact, when you drop down to verses 37 through 50, you will see the word believe six times. And yet, sadly, with the exception of a few people, most people remained in unbelief. Because they remained in unbelief, they had not the knowledge to understand the very events that were happening around them through this voice from heaven. And then Jesus begins to speak in verse 30 through 33. In verse 30, he makes them aware of the fact that this voice and this death that he's about to die is for their benefit. When Jesus will go to the cross, he had them in mind. Just like when he went to the cross, I believe through omniscience, he had you in mind as well. He had me in mind. He had the world in in mind generically, but he had each of us in mind individually. 
This transaction, verse 30, is for you. And it is at this time in history that Satan will be dealt a fatal blow. Verse 31, the prince of this world that we identified as Satan is about to be cast out. What is about to happen on Passover will lay the foundation, if you will, for the ultimate deposement and dethronement of Satan. And we had a chance to look at that last time. And now we pick up the story there in verses 32 and 33, and notice what it says. Jesus says in verse 32, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Verse 33, But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. How is it that the prince and power of the age, Satan, is going to be defeated? How is it that the Son of God is going to fulfill his purpose of existing to glorify the Father? How is it all going to happen? Well, here we learn that it will happen through his crucifixion, through his death. The Son of Man is about to be lifted up, speaking of the lifting up of Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, on that cross. And you'll notice what it says there in verse 32. I find this very interesting. Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw, notice what it says, all men to myself. The message of the cross, when it's preached in its simplicity and its purity, is for every generation. And we have those voices today who are trying to argue that every generation has its own unique desires. Every generation has its own unique needs. Every generation has its own way of looking at things. And so we have to, top to bottom, repackage Christianity. We have to reshuffle the deck to make it applicable to the younger generation coming up. Because if we don't do that, then suddenly the message of the cross will be lost. May I just say to you that Jesus very clearly said, when I am lifted up, verse 32, I will draw all men, not some, all men to myself. The focus, therefore, of Sugarland Bible Church is simply to teach the message of the cross the way it has been given. Now, we can illustrate it. We can do it online. There are different methods that we can use to reach different people. But the fact of the matter is, the basic message never changes. Because that is the message that God honors. He does not honor a message that is our own. He does not honor a message that is watered down or snipped away at or clipped away at for marketing purposes. What every generation needs is a presentation of the cross of Jesus Christ and what he has done in our place. And if you're 16 years old, if you're 12 years old, if you're 7 years old, if you're 99.9 years old, that message is for you. That is the way that the Holy Spirit has designed this message. God is not a respecter of a method He is not a respecter of a man. He is not a respecter of a movement. He is not a respecter of a methodology. What he is a respecter of is the message that he has entrusted to the church. And so our function, therefore, is simply to teach this message with accuracy, being, as Paul said, unashamed of it. Paul, in Romans Chapter 1, around verse 16, says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Many times we are ashamed of it because of its offense. Many times we are ashamed of it because it's not in step with the politically correct age of time that we're in, 
where we're supposed to say all roads lead to God. That's what's politically correct. But the moment we move into political correctness and deviate from the message of God is the moment that we lose the favor of God. It is not our message, it is His message, and we are simply stewards of that message. When I am lifted up, I will draw all men, regardless of generation. Transgenerationally, I will draw all men to myself. Now, you'll notice here the word draw. This is speaking of the move of God towards us before we were even saved. Did you know that before you believed in Jesus Christ, God did something in your life? In fact, He did a lot more in our lives than we're even aware of and cognizant of. I used to think when I got saved at the age of 16 that one day I woke up and I said, well, I guess today's the day I'm going to become a Christian. And the fact of the matter is you look back on your life and you realize what an arrogant mindset that is. Because at the age of 16, I wasn't even looking for God. The fact of the matter is God was looking for me. Luke 19 and verse 10 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. He he was seeking me long before I was seeking him. He was setting up the conversations that I would have. He was setting up the relationships. He was setting up the exact time in history to get this message of the gospel to me. And it's not just true with me. It's true with you. Now, why do we need such a thing? Why is our American philosophy that I get a vote and I have a say, why is that wrong? Yes, we do have a vote, we do have a say, as I'll show you in just a second. But God has done a lot of things prior to us making a decision and believing in Him. Why is that mindset where we do it all on ourselves wrong? Because people that think that way do not understand the depth of sin. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14 says, But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What is God's take on the status of the unbeliever. They do not understand the things of the Spirit, and in fact, their mind is blinded. And consequently, it is necessary for God to do something. Now, unlike the hyper-Calvinist, which tries to argue that God believes for us, that is not what the Bible teaches. What, What the Bible teaches, and we'll see a lot more of this when Jesus begins to unveil the work of the Holy Spirit in the upper room discourse, what the Bible teaches is the Spirit of God is at work putting us under conviction, making us aware of our need for Jesus Christ. Had it not been for that prevenient early work of God in my life, I would not be a Christian today and neither would you. Not very American doctrine, but a doctrine that is consistent with the lost sinful state of those that are under the curses, born into the curses of the first Adam. Now, this word draw is very interesting. You'll notice it there also in verse 32. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Now, we've run into this word before. It's el kuo. El kuo means to draw. And as the drawing is done, there is resistance involved. You might remember that we made reference to this verb when we were in John 6. In John 6, verse 44, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws, that's El Kuo, draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, it is very interesting to me that in John's Gospel, that verb is used many, many times. And as the drawing is happening, there is resistance. 
John 18 and verse 10 says this, Simon Peter, then having a sword, drew it. He pulled it out of its sheath. That's the verb okuo. I get the idea that it doesn't come out automatically. There has to be something done to pull it out. And then also in John 21 and verse 6, it says this, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and they were not able to haul. Now haul is el cuo. They were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. John 21 and verse 11 puts it this way. It says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish. And it gives the number of those fish. There was a lot of them. So as Peter and the disciples are pulling this giant net of fish into the boat, they are pulling it against its own weight. They are pulling it through resistance. That is essentially what is happening to people. They, If they had their own way, they would go straight into hell. They would want nothing to do with God. But God loves them too much to let them, in essence, do what they want. Praise God that God rescues us from our own choices. Amen? And he convicts people. And as they're under conviction, they resent it. They don't like it. Because it's contrary to what they want to do. But the conviction becomes strong. And God won't leave you alone. And finally, you reach a point in your life where you capitulate by faith, which is a choice that you make. There is no verse in the Scripture, particularly in John's Gospel, that says it's a choice that God makes All on his own. There has to be some form of human cooperation. If human cooperation was not involved to any extent, then we are not beings made in the image of God. The whole concept of being made in the image of God means that we share in some, not all, some of his attributes. One of the attributes of God is free choice. Why did God put a tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden to begin with? Why didn't God just leave the tree of knowledge out? That would have saved us all a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? He put the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden because he respected the fact that man, human beings, bear the image of God. And therefore, since we bear the image of God, we have a capacity for choice. We have a capacity to honor God, we have a capacity to reject God. That's what it means to a large extent to be an image bearer of God. There had to have been the avenue of rebellion available if humanity decided to go that route. And thus the purpose of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. In the same way, God is not overriding our free will, and forcing us to get saved. He is putting us sometimes under duress. He is putting us sometimes under pressure. But he is working in our lives far beyond we're aware of. Sometimes he begins to work in our lives, as in the case of Jeremiah, from his mother's womb. Sometimes in the case of Jeremiah and the Apostle Paul, before they were even conceived. Sometimes as little children. He is at work in our lives. But it's all his handiwork where he is pushing us to a place where we will make a decision for him by believing in the message of the cross. Yes, he will work ahead of time. But for you to believe, the onus is on you. That's why it says in this book, 99 times believe. If God was the one who believed for us, 99 commands to believe would be unnecessary, wouldn't they? And so Jesus now is describing what is happening. And as people are under conviction, they are resisting it to the point where the offer of the cross becomes very, very attractive. And the reason it becomes attractive in our minds is because God is doing something to make us aware of our need for Jesus Christ. And yet we come to that place where we finally trust in the message. Now people say, well, what was my role in salvation? Well, one of your roles was to resist and fight God the whole time. 
just like pulling in that boat of uh, into that boat, that giant net of fish. There's resistance. We're fighting God, but finally, the conviction becomes such a nag, and the gospel becomes so attractive that we believe its message. But had it not been for the prevenient grace of God in our lives, we would have never even arrived at the moment of decision. And consequently, Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Now, again, notice all. He is drawing to himself all people. Now, I know many of you have a theology which says God only draws the elect. May I just say to you that we're not really concerned at Sugarland Bible Church about people's individual theologies. What we're concerned about is the Bible. Hence the title, Sugar Land Bible Church. And when you simply look at the Bible and you look at verse 32, it's very clear that he is not drawing some, but he is drawing all to himself. Now, when he begins to unfold this work of the Holy Spirit that he does on our behalf in John 16, verses 7 through 11, he says, and, and he, when he comes, this is the Holy Spirit, will convict the world. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing today. He is convicting the world because God wants all human beings to be in heaven with him. I like the way one uh, commentator put it. He puts it this way. Jesus is not affirming the whole world will be saved. He is affirming that all who are saved are saved in this way. He is not speaking of a universal rather than a narrowly... I think I misspoke there. He is speaking of a universal rather than a narrowly nationalistic religion. When it says, once the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself, the Bible is not teaching the doctrine of universalism. Universalism is the idea that all human beings eventually will be saved. And may I just say to you that that is as as unbiblical as anything, because we know from Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, that at the great white throne judgment, there will be those that go into the lake of fire. We know from Matthew 25 and verse 46, it says, These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. He is drawing all people without distinction to himself. He's not just drawing whites. He's not just drawing blacks or Hispanics or Asians or the rich or the poor or Americans or non-Americans. This is a universal calling that he is currently sending out to the human race. In fact, the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 9 describes those that are saved praising Jesus. And it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 9, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your own blood men from, not some, every tribe, tongue, people, nation, and language. That is the great work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our age. He is making men and women aware of their need for Jesus Christ. He is not believing for them. They will believe. He is not convicting some. The Bible is very clear that he is convicting all. And quite frankly, God has typically worked this way in history. Because just prior to the flood, we know the tragic record of the flood and how only eight were saved. That would be Noah and Mrs. Noah, and their three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their respective wives. Eight people in the ark, and that's it. 1 Peter 3, verse 20 indicates that. 2 Peter 2, around verse 5, indicates that. According to Dr. Henry Morris, there were probably about six billion people on the planet at that time, based on his mathematical computations and population rates and things of that nature. And yet eight people are on the ark. 
And yet, God, to the very last second, was giving people an opportunity to respond to the message. Why? Because the Spirit of God was active back then, just like it is now. Genesis 6 and verse 3 says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. You'll notice that the spirit was striving with man. Very similar, if not identical, to what the spirit of God is doing today. He is striving with people. He is working on people. He is convicting people. And yet, just because God is at work, just because God is convicting, does not mean we are somehow coerced or forced into Christianity. If that were true, it would be a disrespect for the fact that we are image bearers of God that have free choice and volition. And yet, the Spirit of God wants people saved. The Spirit of God is active. The Spirit of God is working. But did you catch the last part of verse 3? My spirit will not strive with man forever. We sometimes think, because we see a particular activity of God, that it will always be that way. God will always be convicting. And yet the Bible says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. That was true Just prior to the days of Noah, it's true today. At some point, it stopped. At some point, those that were in the ark were in and the floodwaters came upon the world. At some point, judgment comes. And may I just say to you that we are living in an age of grace today. The grace of God is being poured out today in an un Precedented manner, and because of this age of time that we're living in called the age of grace, we have this tendency to think that it's always going to be this way. And may I just say that based on the Bible, it will not always be this way. The kingdom is coming in which Jesus Christ will rule with a rod of iron. And therefore, the reason I'm communicating this is we have to alert people to the fact that if you sense the tugging of the Holy Spirit now, do not ignore that tugging. Do not assume that I'm going to do it tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. Committing the sin of presumption that the book of James talks about, presuming you're even going to have it tomorrow. How do we even know we're going to have that? The Bible teaches that in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, today is the day of salvation. And yet the Spirit of God is still active before that time of judgment comes. And yet in verse 36, you see the word believe. You say, well, does God choose us or do we choose God? My answer to that question is yes. When you got married... Did the bride choose the groom or the groom choose the bride? Did the man choose the wife or did the wife choose the husband? I hope your answer to that question is yes. Because it's mutual, is it not? God forbid if you're in a marriage that you were somehow coerced into it. Because that's not love. That is overriding the whole concept of love. And yet, God is moving towards us and He's placing us under conviction so that we will choose Him. And so that is what the pervenient grace or the work of the Holy Spirit does. It's a tremendous statement that Jesus is making. It's very anti-American because we believe completely and totally in our own resources. And yet a statement like this says, you came to Christ because God did something on your behalf. He didn't believe for you. But He brought you to the point of needing to trust in Christ through the pervenient work of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, therefore, is describing what is about to happen on Passover and the subsequent work of the Holy Spirit through his death and him being lifted up. Now, as you can imagine, those that are listening to this think it a very strange teaching. Notice what they say in verse 34 in response to Jesus Christ. It says, The crowd then answered him, we have heard out of the law. Now, the law there, you're tended, is a tendency to think it's the Old Testament. 
It really is not the Old Testament. It is their perverted interpretation of the Old Testament. That's what they're talking about when they're saying the law. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Quoting Jesus, the Son of Man must be lifted up. They quote his words back to him. And then at the end of verse 34, they continue to ask the question, Who is the Son of Man? Who is the Son of Man? Well, according to the Old Testament, the Son of Man is the great reigning Messiah that will come at the end of the age and he will dethrone a revived Roman Empire and he will inaugurate his literal political kingdom on planet Earth, a kingdom which shall never end. That's who the Son of Man is. They're likely referring to Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14 which says, I kept looking in the vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given great dominion and glory and a kingdom Then all peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be Destroyed. That is what this unbelieving Jewish crowd is thinking about when Christ refers to himself as the Son of Man. In fact, the reference that Christ makes to himself as the Son of Man, that was the very reference that got him killed. Because in Mark 14, in one of the trials of Jesus Christ, there were a total of six trials, three Jewish, three Roman, but in one of his trials... In Mark 14, verses 61 through 64, it says this, But he kept silent and did not not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Question mark. And Jesus said, I am. And you, now he's quoting Daniel 7, 13, shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, tearing The close, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. They took a title that Jesus had applied to himself and assumed that that title meant an automatic reigning of God now. And when Jesus, as the suffering servant, applied that title to him, is the moment it confounded their understanding of what a Messiah should be, and consequently they rushed him through the court system to get this man dead in a great mockery or an injustice. And what was the trigger point? It was this reference to himself, Jesus, being the Son of Man. They are confused and disoriented as as to what he is saying. You've called yourself the Son of Man. Then why do you say you must be lifted up? How is the Son of Man supposed to be lifted up? The point I'm making is they, in their perverted understanding of the Old Testament, could not conceive of a suffering Messiah. That's why I've entitled this message, A Suffering Messiah? Question mark. How, if you're the Messiah, does it play out that you are supposed to first suffer? And may I just say to you, the blindness that first century Israel was under back in the time of Christ is the identical blindness the unbelieving Jew is under right now as I speak. In fact, the Apostle Paul will write in 2 Corinthians 3 that a veil has been placed over their eyes. They stumble over this issue of a Messiah who dies. They want a Messiah who will rule and reign, but not a Messiah who dies. Now, why is that a stumbling block? It is a stumbling block to them because they do not see largely themselves as sinners in the hands of an angry God. Sinners in the presence of holiness. If you do not see yourself that way because you think you can merit 
favor through your own works of self-righteousness. The idea of a suffering Messiah is something that is foreign to your way of thinking. A suffering Messiah only makes sense to an individual who understands their need spiritually for someone to enter the world and pay the debt for the sins of humanity. In fact, uh, I was in law school, and not to be overly stereotypical, I had many, many students, fellow students, and faculty members that were at that same school. A lot of Jews go into the fields of medicine and law and into the professions. And I had many opportunities to question them as to why they do not accept the idea that Jesus is their Messiah. I would show them passages in the Old Testament. One of the things I would show them is Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, which indicates that the Messiah will be cut off and inherit nothing. Another passage I would show them is Isaiah 53 and verse 3, which says he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from which men hide their face. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And I would say there it is in your old own Bible. Why is it that you cannot embrace the idea that Jesus Christ is your Savior? And the answer was always the same. They said Jesus is not the Messiah because there is no shalom in the world. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. When they use the word shalom, they are interpreting it completely different than the way the evangelical mind interprets it. When we use the word peace, we're talking about peace with God. Peace with God because our sin debt has been paid for. When the unbelieving Jewish mind uses the word shalom, they are talking about politics. They are talking about the world stage. They are talking about the fact that the nation of Israel is being bullied about by pagan powers. If Jesus was indeed the Messiah, we would have shalom. We would have the political kingdom upon the earth. Blinded to the reality that there cannot be a political kingdom until the sin barrier between God and man is dealt with. There will be no political peace. There will be no political shalom unless there is spiritual shalom. But you only begin to think that way when your heart has been touched by the Spirit of God and you begin to see yourself the way God sees you as a lost sinner careening into hell. No amount of persuasion and linguistics can convince a person of that. It is the sovereign move and the work of the Holy Spirit. And if that Spirit of God has not touched an individual's heart in that manner, then they don't think in terms of spiritual terms. They think all about politics and external peace. And consequently, this title, the Son of Man, This messianic title was a great stumbling block to them because Jesus would say the Son of Man, that he was the Son of Man in one breath, and he would begin to articulate the manner of his death in the next breath. And that's not how it's supposed to work according to their perversion of their own scripture. A Messiah is supposed to come in here and get rid of the Roman Empire. This Roman Empire that we have hated, that has been an occupier of the land of Israel, going all the way back to Pompeii in 63 B.C. and is subjecting our people to onerous taxes, we want a Messiah to get rid of that. And consequently in John 6, we saw that great scene where the great crowd came and tried to make Jesus Christ king by force. And yet Jesus would have nothing to do with that. Because his mission in coming into the world the first time is not to solve the political problems in the nation of Israel. It is to deal with the sin barrier. It is to cast out the prince of this world, laying the groundwork for his defeat. It is to glorify the Father. But if you do not see yourself as a sinner, that message seems foolishness to you. And thus, where is the nation of Israel today without Jesus Christ? They're in the exact same position. They are looking around desperately for someone to fix 
the political turmoil and constraints that they are now in. And consequently, they are sitting ducks as it presently exists. Not for Jesus Christ, but for the Antichrist. Because you see, the Bible teaches that there will be that ruler. He's called a rider on the white horse. He is described in Revelation 6 and verses 1 and really 1, 2, 3, and 4. He will come in as a conqueror. He will fix the politics of the world, particularly the politics of Israel. He will bring peace to the world. Not the spiritual shalom, but the political shalom that the Jewish unbelieving mind is looking for. And he will fit all the caricatures and criteria of who the unbelieving Jewish mind thinks that the Messiah is going to be. And they're going to say, this is our guy. And consequently, it will not be until about three and a half years into that process that he will betray them by, in essence, doing something that has not been done to the nation of Israel since the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, going back to about 167 B.C. He will betray the Jewish people. He will set up in the Jewish temple a pagan image. He will tell the Jews no more sacrifices in this temple. He will try to exterminate their religion. And in fact, the Jewish mind understands that this has already happened. Antiochus did the same thing to us. That is why they celebrate today Hanukkah, or Feast of Lights, or dedication. It was how they got control of the Temple Mount back from Antiochus, the Seleucid, and they consequently liberated it. God was at work in that process And they say over and over again, this will never happen again. Is that not a Jewish slogan, never again? What is our Bible saying? It will happen again. In fact, it's going to happen worse. And once their eyes are open to that reality is the shock to the system that will be needed whereby they will look back and say, wow, we've had it wrong all these 2,000 years or more. Jesus was the Messiah. But it's not until a jolt of that nature happens to them that they will become open to Jesus Christ as their Savior. They will see the problem is not just political, it is spiritual. And that is the trajectory that the nation of Israel is on. It's one of the reasons I do not believe the church can be here during this time period. Because we, as members of the church of Jesus Christ, already understand this basic truth. We are rightly related to Christ by faith. But not so the nation of Israel. Blind to their need for a spiritual Messiah. Therefore, a sitting duck to someone who comes along offering the olive branch of political peace. Everything that is happening in the world as I speak is setting the stage for this great phenomenon that's coming. In fact, even uh, at the end of last week, I was reading a couple of news articles about how the world community is currently turning its back on the nation of Israel Even the late great United States of America, at one time a great ally of the nation of Israel, even the late great United States of America is turning its back on Israel, entering into, with the rest of the world community, an agreement with Iran, a regime controlled by Shiite Muslims, a regime whose leadership has said repeatedly, we want to wipe Israel off the map. And how the world community is entering into an agreement with this regime. Much to the consternation of Benjamin Netanyahu and the Jews. And the agreement is simply this. We will relax sanctions on Iran if Iran gives up what? Almost nothing. It's a completely one-sided agreement. And the Jews are looking at this and saying, we can't trust anybody. We can't even trust America, who supposedly is pushing and brokering this arrangement. And how you can see they will immediately hope in this rider on the white horse, 
who will bring forth a solution to Iran, the Dome of the Rock, and every other problem that they're facing at a political level. And yet it's a deception. It's a deception because they have not embraced the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it is not until this rider on the white horse betrays them and jolts them through a shock to the system by replicating what Antiochus in the intertestamental period did, that they will wake up through great tribulation and come to an awareness that Jesus Christ indeed is their Messiah. One of the great pieces of theology I ever learned was from the individual that brought me to Christ. He said, God knocks us down, so we look up. The whole scenario that is about to happen with Israel, and I'm not a date setter, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. If I knew the date, I'd sell some books and be a lot wealthier than I am at the present time. I don't know when it's all going to play out. I know this much, though. The scenario in store for Israel is she will be knocked down through betrayal so that she looks up to her Messiah. I believe that as the Spirit of God here at the close of the church age is convicting people of their need for Christ so that the body of Christ will be completed, He is following largely that same strategy. He is knocking us down so that we look up. He will allow in your life things to not work out right. The marriage that you had hoped on doesn't work out. The business deal that you have banked your hopes on seems to go south. Nothing seems to fit. Or sometimes God allows you to succeed beyond your wildest expectations, and you get to the very top of the corporate ladder, and you say there's a gnawing emptiness inside of me. That is another form of him knocking us down so that we look up. He uses different strategies for different people, different strokes for different folks. But it is all to bring a human being to the point where they need Jesus Christ so that they will trust in his provision. That is the plan that will happen with Israel after the rapture of the church, and it is the plan largely that I believe God is pursuing with the unsaved today. He is knocking us down so that we look up. And once you get to a point in your life where you say, Lord, I just don't have any other options. I'm at the end of my resources. I don't know what I'm going to do. That's the minute God says, thumbs up. I've got you right where I want you. And now you're going to trust me. And as you trust me, I'm going to reveal to you my son. And as I reveal to you my son, you can have the gift of life now. Now what about my bankruptcy? What about my divorce? What about my emptiness? What about my problems? God says don't worry about that. We'll we'll navigate that together. Because now you've got someone to walk through the fires of life with. As long as you're on your own, you've got no one with you. But your own intelligence and your own resources, and we all know how limited those are. But once the person believes in Jesus Christ, there suddenly becomes that fourth man in the fire. Daniel chapter Suddenly there comes that one that the book of Proverbs says sticks closer than a brother. And now we're going to handle those difficulties and those problems together. And yet how sad it is that those looking for the wrong kind of peace can't see it. And God weeps for them in their state of unbelief. He will not give up on them even though they may give up on God. He will continue to harass them through conviction. He will orchestrate things in their lives to bring them to himself. But the final choice of whether a human being is going to come to Christ or not is ultimately yours. God can only do so much. My spirit will not strive with man forever. He is mortal. His days shall be 120 years. Now, as the crowd gives this very confused statement, 
Notice what Jesus says in verses 35 and 36. We're not going to be moving on beyond verses 35 and 36 today, but we're going to complete the first round of this conversation as Jesus begins to speak. Notice verse 35. So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. They're confused by the statement that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, and yet in the next breath he says, I've got to be lifted up, speaking of his death. We've talked about how that statement is a blatant contradiction to the unbelieving Jewish mind. They want an answer to that. Jesus' answer to them in response is, I'm not going to answer it the way you want it answered. And that's a very important lesson to learn. We come to God demanding answers. I have come to God demanding answers. And many times I get the answer. And guess what? It's sure not the method I thought God was going to use. He answers me in a much greater way through a totally different route. We've got to be very careful about coming to God and saying, I have this problem, and God, here's your options. Here's how you're going to fix it. And the fact of the matter is, God has no limitations. You will be astonished at how he's able to fix so-called problems in our lives. But Jesus says, I'm not going to answer the question the way you posed it, but here's what I want you to focus on. You'll notice this expression, verse 35, in a little while. The light of God is with you for but a little while. Speaking, I believe, of the imminent or the approaching death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to be here forever. In fact, a few days down the road, I'm about to be killed. I will rise from the dead, but 40 days after that, I will ascend back to heaven. I will not be here forever, but while I am here, I have disclosed to you light. He has told them, particularly in verse 36, exactly what they need to do. And what he tells them to do in verse 35 is to walk in the light that you have while it is available. A little while, that's all, and the light will be gone. My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is mortal, and his days shall be 120 years. We assume that the grace of God in our lives just continues on and on and on, and it's not that way. All of us have, to some extent, light that we are to respond to. You say, well, I don't know everything I need to know about the Bible. There are great things of the Bible that I don't understand. Well, welcome to the club. But here's what you do have. He has revealed to you certain truths. He has given to all of us, even as his children, light. Are we responding to the truth that we have? There may not... Reach a point in your life where you understand the Bible and systematic theology and the great truths of God from beginning to end. But you do have something you understand. All of us do. And are we responding to the light which we have? Because if we don't respond to the light, verse 35, where does that leave us? That leaves us in the darkness. What happens in the darkness? We stumble about, groping about in darkness, not knowing where we are going. That is why the dark is such a fear to the young child. I have a seven-year-old at home. I understand that. I'm 47, and I get a little afraid of the dark myself. Particularly, as I was moving from Dallas to Houston, we had a bunch of boxes set up in the house. I was in a new house. I got up in the middle of the night for a drink of water, forgetting that box was there, and you just went, I went right over it, surprised I didn't break my neck in the process. That's why the dark is such a fearful thing. We're, we're stumbling about not knowing where we're going. And if we will not respond to the light of God, spiritually speaking, that is the only thing left. 
We are left with our own finite minds, finite talent, finite resources, trying to navigate something called life. And yet the one who designed life, the one who understands how the solar system functions, the one who ordained the law of gravity and all of the things that are necessary, wants a relationship with us. And we learn to walk in his light by faith. And he is that great lamp or that light that helps us along the way. But if we will not receive the light, what are we really left with at the end of the day other than darkness? And that is what people are like that have rejected Jesus Christ. Stumbling around in the darkness. May I make this just a little bit more personal? That is what the Christian can be like. When God shows you something, either through a sermon or through prayer or through his word or a radio program, a television program, he reveals something to you and he shines light on a problem in your life. And he says, you've got to change this. Don't do it through your own strength. You don't have it. But I will help you to change it. And we put off the light. Why? Because sin is enjoyable, isn't it? And yet, what do we shut our minds to? The light that God wanted to have in our lives. We stumble, even as Christians, I'm of the persuasion to a very large extent because we resist the yearnings of the Holy Spirit. You see, the same Holy Spirit that worked overtime to bring you to a point to believe in Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, is the same Holy Spirit that is working overtime in your growth as a Christian. The same God that saves you is the same God that wants to progressively sanctify you. The same God that brought you to Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, is the same God or Holy Spirit that wants you to grow up in Christ. He wants you to mature. He wants you to come of age. And we resist that second calling many times because we're too in love with our own sin. And we, even as Christians, stumble around in the darkness. We have a tendency to think it's just the unbelievers in darkness. May I just say to you, that is not true. Paul the Apostle in the book of Ephesians says, If we let the sun go down on our anger, just as an example, we give the devil a foothold. How many Christians do we know that Satan has a foothold in their lives and in their minds because they would not respond to the light of God which they have? And yet that's what we are left with when we reject the light. The whole thing wraps up there in verse 36. While you have the light, here comes the B word, believe in the light so that you may become sons of the light. You notice he says, while you have the light. Again, it's contrary to the common human assumption that the light will always be there. The convicting ministry of Jesus Christ to the unbeliever will always be there. The convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit to the nagging sin in the believer's life will always be there. May I just say to you, it's not true. While you have the light, you may not have it forever. While you have the light, now to the unbeliever, believe in the light. Believe, as we have said many times from this pulpit, is the single condition the lost sinner must satisfy in order to enter a, to a relationship with God. It is used about 160 or more times in the New Testament as the single condition that must be satisfied to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is used about 98, 99 times in John's Gospel. It says it so frequently. In fact, at this concluding paragraph, which we're not going to be looking at tonight, it repeats it six times. It is so crystal clear, I'm shocked at how we have mucked it up so frequently. How we have muddied the waters so frequently. And yet the unbeliever is to believe in the Son. You'll notice very clearly that Jesus gives different directions depending on who he's talking to. You recall what he said to the believers in verses 22 and 23? And into verse 25, 
he told them to become disciples. We've talked about the difference between being a believer and being a disciple. And then as we go into verse 29, as this crowd of individuals is now interacting with Christ, we would take that to be mostly unsaved people, if not exclusively. He tells them what they have to do. They have to believe. What's he telling everybody to do? Respond to the light that you have. Don't pretend like there's going to be more light, or the light will be with you forever. You've got it now, though. Rather than worrying about how long I'm going to have the light, take advantage of the opportunity while it's available to you, is what Jesus is saying. To the Believer, respond to the light of progressive sanctification. To the unbeliever, respond to the light of the gospel. While you are still able. And the promise to me is amazing in verse 36. So that you may become sons of the light. What happens when we respond to the light of God, either in our progressive sanctification Or to receive salvation. What happens when we respond to the truth that we have? You then become the vehicle for the dispensing of further light. God is using those to spread his light who have responded to the light themselves. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5 says, For you are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We are not of the night. We are not of the darkness. The word sons is very interesting because in the scripture, the son is the inheritor. Galatians 4 and verse 7 says, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. If a son, then an heir through God. We are the inheritors. An inheritor is somebody who has something legally coming to them, which they have not received yet factually, in point of fact. We have a great inheritance in store for us. One of the great inheritances that's coming our direction is our citizenship and our participation in the kingdom of light. And in the interim, we are the ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, of this coming kingdom. What is an ambassador? America's ambassador to Iran is someone who represents American values on Iranian soil. What are you if you respond to the light? By faith as an unbeliever and by growth as a Christian. What do you become? You become the ambassador or the representative of God in hostile territory which, as of the present time, is still being controlled by the prince and power of the air. He has been cast out. We saw last time that the groundwork for his deposement has all been laid through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. He is a defeated foe. But until he is finally deposed, We are living on his terrain and his territory. And as responders to the light of God, God then begins to use us to shine light on others. The fact of the matter is, folks, God wants to use you a lot more than you want to be used. We say, God, use me, use me. And he says, I'm so glad you asked. That's what I've been waiting for you to say for your whole life. I've wanted to use you more than you want to be used. It is amazing what God will do with people who respond to his message. How he will use them as a vehicle of light to the world. Jesus said this, didn't he? In Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand and gives it light to the whole house. To all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your talents and abilities. No, glorify your Father who is in heaven. That is what the blueprint of God for your life is. He wants you saved. 
He wants you growing so he can use you to bring forth light in a world that is under hostile control. That's his blueprint. That's his design. So the message that I have for the believer is to respond to any light that you have in your life. The Spirit of God, no doubt, has agitated some of you this morning. He's agitated you because there's something in your life or your soul that is not right with Him. And He wants you to remove it through His power. And then to the unbeliever, no doubt, the unbeliever, if there's any here today, are no doubt agitated and irritated because the Holy Spirit has been bothering you about a decision that you need to make. The decision is to either trust or not trust in the Son. And this is what we call the gospel, which means good news. Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, stepped out of eternity into time to live a life in my place, which I could never live, to pay a horrific penalty for my sin debt, which I could never in a lifetime of good works pay back. And the gospel is to telestai, which is one of the most beautiful words in the Greek language. It means paid in full. You add nothing to it. Jesus, through his resurrection and ultimately his ascension, vindicated every promise he ever made because there's never been a man that's been born that's claimed to be God and yet proved it through bodily resurrection. He sits now at the right hand of the Father where he orchestrates the work of the church worldwide, trusting the church with a simple message. And the basic message we have, we have a lot of different tasks, but our basic message is to present the gospel, which is that it's all been paid for and it's all been done. You simply receive it as a free gift by way of faith. And if that's something that you're torn about, I'm available after the service to talk. If it's something you have more questions on, I'm available after the service to talk. But it's something that you can do right now with no fanfare or show. It happens in the privacy of a person's mind and thoughts and heart as the Holy Spirit places them under conviction. We've seen today that the Spirit draws all men to Christ. That means you. That means all of us. And so as you're sitting there, perhaps as an unbeliever, respond by faith to the message of the cross. Respond to the message of the Son of Man being lifted up. Another way of saying it is trust, rely, depend upon, or have confidence in. You reach a point in your life where you're no longer trusting in yourself for the safekeeping of your soul, but you're trusting exclusively and solely in the work of Jesus Christ. And that's the moment you become saved. It doesn't matter what church you go to, where your church membership is at, how devout your parents were. Your point of salvation and life begins at that point. Respond to the message of the truth for the unbeliever. To the believer, respond to the light that God has given you this morning to walk in progressive sanctification. Shall we pray? We're so grateful, Father, that John was used by you to record this very timely message for our age. Make us good stewards of the truth that we're learning. Continue to be with us, Lord, as we progress through John's gospel. Make us people of light this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And God's people said. I know those verses that I was supposed to read are in here somewhere. Here we go. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Shed light to someone you don't know on the way out. God bless you. You're dismissed.